Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. The other day we took a look at a high-end Lenovo laptop. Now we've got the lowest of the low end here. This is the IdeaPad 1, and this is likely the least expensive Lenovo laptop you can buy running Windows. This is the 14-inch version, and we're going to take a closer look at what this machine can and can't do in just a second. But I do want to let you know, in the interest of full disclosure, that I paid for this with my own funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now, the price point on this is around $229 at the time I'm recording this video. Inside, it has an Intel Celeron processor, an N4020. This is in their Gemini Lake series of chips, and these are lower-end processors versus the i5s and i7s that are out there. But the machine is completely fanless, so it makes no noise at all while you're using it, unless you have some music playing or something along those lines. Doesn't have much for specifications beyond that. Four gigabytes of RAM that is not upgradable and 64 gigabytes of storage. We did take it apart to see what we could do to it. And unfortunately, there is not much you can do with it at all other than swapping out components and replacing them. You can see there's a lot of empty space in the case. I think there might be an 11 inch version of this out there somewhere. Oddly, there is a spot where you could fit a M.2 drive in there to expand the storage, but they did not solder in a connector so this laptop is completely not upgradable no matter what you try to do to it and unfortunately the ram is configured in such a way that it does hinder its gaming performance these aren't great gaming laptops to begin with uh, but this one in particular is going to be very limited in what it can do now this is a 14 inch laptop typically we see computers with 11 inch displays at this price point but the display itself is not all that great. It is running at 1366 by 768. That's basically 720p. And it's the same resolution that you'll get on an 11 inch laptop. So although the screen is bigger, you can't fit any more on this screen than you could on an 11 inch laptop. So if you're getting a little bit older like I am, it's probably a little easier to look at, but still uh, there is no 1080p option on this one at the moment, at least here in the United States. The display isn't bad for its price. It is a TN display, so it lacks the crispness that you get out of a more expensive IPS display, but it does get the job done. It's not all that bright here, as you can see, but again, adequate, I think, for the overall price point. It is all plastic. It weighs about three pounds or 1.36 kilograms, and the keyboard actually isn't bad on this. You've got the typical Lenovo layout. The key quality, as far as the build quality, doesn't feel as nice as their more expensive yogas out there, but it's still very easy to type on. It's got a good tactile feel to it. There's no backlight or fingerprint reader, but Lenovo makes good keyboards, and this one is exactly the same size as their other ones. So I think it's a good typing device if you're doing a lot of command line work or word processing and that sort of thing. The trackpad isn't great. It's a bit springy. Um, but it does get the job done for basic work, but I wish it was a little less on the springy side. There isn't much for ports on this one. You do have your power plug here for plugging in its power adapter. You have two USB 3 ports here. These are full-size USB-A ports. You have an HDMI output here, so you can plug in an external display. Uh, this might go up to 4K, but it's only going to go at 30 frames per second. And this machine isn't all that fast either, so I think your best bet is to get a 1080p display hooked up, and that will run at 60 frames per second. Uh, this is a micro SD card slot, and this will be very important for augmenting its lack of onboard storage. Remember, it only has 64 gigs built in, so I would suggest getting an SD card to go with this so you can store things uh, without taking up too much room on the internal hard drive. This is the only way to expand storage on this device. On the other side here, we just have the headphone jack and nothing else. Now, surprisingly, this does have stereo speakers on board. You've got a speaker here on the left and on the right. The sound quality is pretty bad, as you might expect, very tinny, but probably adequate for doing web conferences or something. But of course, this does have Bluetooth on board, so you can connect Bluetooth headphones you can also plug in headphones to that headphone jack on the right-hand side here, and that jack also supports microphone in. 
Uh, the unit here has AC Wi-Fi on board, so you'll be able to get on your network fairly easily. This is not a more modern Wi-Fi 6 configuration, but you can actually upgrade the Wi-Fi card down the road if you wanted to. That was the one socketed thing we found inside of it when we took it apart. Now there is a webcam here at the top. It is probably one of the worst webcams I've seen in a long time. It's only running at 480p in a four by three aspect ratio. Horrible video quality. Uh, probably okay maybe for Zoom, but you will be noticeably uh, lower resolution versus the rest of the participants out there. Generally, we see a 720p webcam even on low end hardware like this. So it was surprising to see one so lousy here. Uh, so just be aware of that. You might need to add another webcam to the mix here. Now, battery life on this isn't bad, actually, about eight hours or so if you're just sticking to basic kinds of tasks and keeping the display brightness down. And that's about all you can do with a computer like this. So I think for most people, they should get a good workday out of this before needing to charge again. Uh, we did install Google Chrome a little bit earlier. Uh, this ships with Microsoft Windows in what they call S mode which allows you to only install software from the Microsoft App Store, but you can very easily remove S mode and then download whatever you want to it. So that's what we did here to get Chrome working. And for basic web browsing, it's fine. You can do your email, you can catch up on the news. Everything seems to be rendering in okay here, but again, it won't be as fast or zippy as something that might cost a few hundred dollars more. And we also loaded up a 60 frames per second video off of my YouTube channel, and we are getting some drop frames here at that frame rate. I'm not noticing them as I'm watching the video, but on the statistics page here, I'm seeing a drop frame or two every couple of seconds. So it's not something all that noticeable, but it is something that you don't typically see with one of these processors if the memory is configured in dual channel configuration, and this one is in single channel. Uh, if you are watching Netflix and other services that are working at 24 frames per second or 30, I don't think you'll notice anything at all. But just on the high frame rate stuff, know that if you are keeping an eye on statistics like I am here, you will notice a few drop frames every couple of seconds. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 52. And that puts this right in line with another device we looked at running with the same processor, a Chromebook from Lenovo. So it's performing as we would expect it to perform based on its RAM configuration. Now you might be wondering, given all the limitations we've been talking about, who this laptop is really for? Well, I think it's really designed as an alternative to a Chromebook. Microsoft has really built up their Microsoft 365 platform that includes the desktop apps like Word here, but also web versions of those things. And it's a very close alternative, I think, at this point to the Google ecosystem. So the performance here is good enough to run Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. It's not, again, gonna knock your socks off performance-wise versus some more expensive computers, but it's adequate. And often that is the case too with those very low-cost Chromebooks. Now, usually when we look at one of these lower-end Intel machines, they can run older games like Half-Life 2 here at a pretty decent frame rate, especially at 720p. Here we are struggling to maintain 30 frames per second and that's because of its single channel memory configuration. So this is not running at its full potential because of that. And as a result of this, I am not going to recommend this for gaming at all, at least games that you're going to run natively on here. And even not so demanding games like Shovel Knight here were struggling to run at their full frame rate. Typically on a dual channel machine like this, we'll get this game running at 60 frames per second, even at 1080p. Here we were seeing a lot of lag and slowdown at the 720p resolution of the display. And on the 3 d Mark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 2,576. This came in right within the margin of error of the Asus L210 that we looked at a few months ago with the same chip, but that one is also running in single channel mode. But I was pleased to see that it did a lot better than the HP Stream 11 that we looked at a few weeks back which was even more constrained than this machine was. And on the 3 d Mark stress test, we got a failing grade of 94.1%, and you can see what temperature it was running at when that test concluded. This is not a surprise because this is a fanless machine, and when it is placed under heavy sustained load, the only way it can cool itself off is by slowing itself down, and that might have been some of the contributing factors we saw to performance when we were playing Shovel Knight a little bit earlier. But all is not lost for gamers because I did find it does a pretty good job streaming games. 
and that includes streaming games on your home network or in this case from the Game Pass Ultimate service. So we were playing Forza Horizon 5 here that was coming in over the Xbox app. Again, it's not running locally on the computer here. It's streaming it over the internet, but because it has a pretty decent Intel AC Wi-Fi radio on board, it was able to performed that task quite well. We did see a couple of drop frames here and there, similar to what we saw on the YouTube video, but nothing that really impacted gameplay all that much. So if you are looking for a game streaming device, this actually will probably do a pretty decent job of it. All right, one last thing to take a look at, and that is how well it runs Linux. And we booted up Ubuntu a little bit earlier and found that it was a very good experience. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, video, all of those things got detected properly audio worked just fine, and the performance was good too. And if you are looking to run some Linux distributions on something low cost and portable, this might be worth taking a look at because it seems to work just fine with Linux as it does with Windows. So altogether, it's not bad for the price point. I do wish the memory was upgradable because that would give you the opportunity to boost its performance a bit. But beyond that, I think for the price point, it meets my very limited expectations here. Windows runs fine, as does Linux. And I think if you are in the market for something super low cost, one of the advantages of going with something from Lenovo is that this is a name brand here at a low price. And if you have some kind of warranty issue after you purchase it, it's going to be relatively easy to get support versus some of the more generic brands you might encounter. So altogether for the price, not bad, although I would have liked to have seen some upgradability on this one. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman, Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.